We will be reading today from Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 to 26. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. <clears throat> what, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You may be seated. Here in Matthew, Jesus has about three months left to live, and he knows it. Jesus is intentionally traveling south from Galilee um, to Jerusalem. He's headed to Jerusalem so that the religious leaders there can kill him. He's going to Jerusalem to die to save you and I from the hell that we deserve. As Jesus passes through Perea, this is where he is at this point, he's passing through Jer Perea and people keep stopping him and asking him questions. Last time it was the Pharisees that came and asked him about divorce. Today, another man comes to Jesus, a young man, a rich young man. Look at verse 16. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? Mark records in his gospel that this man ran up to Jesus and knelt before him to ask him this question. There is something this young man urgently needs to know. What good thing must I do so that I may inherit eternal life? Now this young man is asking the right question. Ah, oh, that the burning question in the hearts of people in America today would be this. What must I do to have eternal life? We tend to focus almost exclusively on lesser things. For most people, what's the burning question in their heart right now? They're, maybe it's, how can I be happy in this life? Or, how can I extend this life? But this young man is wiser than the vast majority of people today. He understands that the primary thing that matters in this life is getting ready for the eternal life that follows. Jesus will explain later on in this gospel that there's two destinations, two possible destinations that come after this life, and both of those last forever. Look here at Matthew 25, 46. Jesus will say, those, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Eternal punishment is so horrible of a concept that I think I just, I automatically push it out of my mind rather than considering it. You know, the only thing that gets us through difficulties is, is hope. So this year, so, so often we're like, 2021 has got to be better, right? If we can just get through 2020, if, you know, it's, it's got to start getting better. And when we hold on to that hope and it really helps us while we're in the midst of difficulty, people in hell will not have hope. There's, there's not an end to their punishment and they know it. There's no escape. Eternal life, on the other hand, eternal life is so good that we would do well to contemplate it every day. Our family just recently watched a, a, a movie um, that portrayed some of the difficulties that 
uh, uh, slaves, black slaves were enduring in, uh, in America's history and they're, they're singing these spirituals about heaven because their life was so miserable and they're, and they're setting their hope on something that's coming and, and truly, if we, if we grasp the goodness of what we have coming, we would look at all of our trials down here, difficult though they are, and say, well, this is, this is light, this is momentary compared to the glory that's coming. And so something has happened in this young man's life, and we don't know what it is, but, but he is urgently concerned with eternal life. And so he runs through the crowd, rich and impressive though he may be. He runs through the crowd. He falls down on his knees before the teacher, and he says, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? I invite you this morning to listen to Jesus' answer to this question and to search your own life and to search your own heart. Are you sure that you are ready for the life that comes after this one? The great reality that each of us faces is this, Hebrews 9.27, it is appointed for men to die once and after this comes judgment. So this young man, he has the right focus on eternal life and he's also coming to the right place. He's come to Jesus. But though he's here, he's not ready. He's not ready for the judgment to come. He's not ready for eternity. This young man has a wrong assumption and we can tell it in the way that he phrases his question. Do you see there? He says, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? This young man, along with most of humanity, comes to Jesus with the assumption that obtaining eternal life is the result of doing good things. He wants to be sure he's in. And so he, he wants to know, what, what do I have to do? Jesus, give me the good thing to do so that I can be in heaven. Now, at some point, this man is going to have to learn that that's not how eternal life comes. And that's not how this works. No one obtains eternal life by doing good things. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter four. It says, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. The man's question, what good thing must I do, shows that he doesn't yet understand how it is that we get right in God's eyes. It's not by doing things. But it's interesting in Jesus' answer to this question, faith versus works is not where Jesus goes. So let's listen. What does Jesus say? How does he answer this question? How does one obtain eternal life? The first thing that Jesus says is this. You must confess, to, to get to heaven, you must confess that you are not a good person. To get to heaven, you must confess you are not a good person, but that you have failed to please God. We'll find out that this young man, as he comes up to Jesus, he views himself as being pretty good already. But there's a sense in his heart that he, he, he doesn't feel like he's quite done enough to be secure. It's like he's coming to Jesus and he's like, okay, Jesus, I, there's some, I, I'm not sure I'm there. And so, well, I mean, I've been pretty good, but what else do I have to do? Like, is there... Is it like one or two extra things that I got to do to make sure I'm in? And this is the, it's the, the misery of somebody that thinks that they have to earn their way into heaven. Like how much, how good do I have to be? He, he kind of feels like maybe he needs to be a little better and he wants Jesus to tell him. But Jesus is going to say to him and he says to us, if I'm to live forever, I have to, I have to admit I am not a good person, and I have completely failed to please him. And, in, and until a person realizes that, and will just honestly say before the Lord, I am not a good person, I have completely failed. Until that happens, there will be no eternal life for you. And so Jesus wants to direct this man's heart in this way. Letter A on your sheets, um, God's standard of goodness are higher than any man's. He, Jesus wants to graciously show this man that he's not good. And so his first thing that he says in answer to his question, what good thing do I do that I may have eternal life? Jesus said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. Have, have any of you read the book of Numbers lately? 
Book, book of Numbers gets a bad rap. Now, it's true, it's called Numbers, and if you open up to it, it starts off with a bunch of numbers. And so everyone's like, eh, we'll skip it. Let's, what's next? Deuteronomy, okay, <laughs> right? But if you, if you <laughs> endure through the numbers, there's, there's a fascinating historical account in the book of Numbers. What happens is the people of, they've just, people of Israel, they've just left Egypt, and they're on their way to the promised land. And for the first time in the people's history, right in the midst of these people, God dwells. Like, literally, in the middle of the camp, the, the tabernacle is there, and God is with them. But it is not working out the way they had hoped. That what they're finding out is that if you live so close to a holy God, the contrast between his perfect goodness and your sin is just stark and painful. And they keep sinning. They keep rebelling. They keep complaining. They keep sinning against him. And so because of their sin and they're so close to him, God's judgment keeps flowing out on them. And people are dying because of their sin. And they call out after a while of this being so close to God as sinners. They say, behold, we perish. We are dying. We are all dying. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord must die. Are we to perish completely? This young man who comes to Jesus, he has good intentions. He's just thinking, okay, Jesus, I want to get up to the standard that'll get me into heaven. What extra good thing do I have to do to, to earn my way in? And Jesus can see his heart and he's trying to tell him Son, you're not even close. Like it's not that you're almost there and we do these extra things and you'll get in. No, what, ha what needs to happen for you, you need to go from evil to perfect in God's sight if you want to be in. And so Jesus says, there is only one who is good, right? And it's, it's not you. To get to heaven, you, you must confess that you're not a good person, but that you've failed to please God. God's standards of goodness are higher than any man's. Now, how, how can we see that? You know, because we just, we just naturally think, well, I'm a pretty good person, right? And I, I try to be nice to the people around me. And so how can it be that, that I, who think of myself as pretty good, how, how can I see that I'm not? Well, what Jesus does for this young man is he's going to direct him to the righteous commands of God. Letter B on your sheets there, God's righteous commands should reveal to you how far you've fallen short of God's goodness. God's righteous commands should reveal to you how far you've fallen short of God's goodness. Look at verse 17. Okay, so he came to Jesus. What, what do I have to do to attain eternal life? Jesus says, why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Now, if you know the Bible well, you might be thinking, Jesus, what are you doing? What are you saying? No one can keep the commandments. Jesus knows that, but this young man does not know it. Listen, as long as someone thinks, I'm keeping God's commandments, as long as someone thinks, I'm living up to God's expectations, that person can never be forgiven and they can never enter heaven. If I think I'm good enough, I think I'm doing pretty good, I'm on my way to hell. And so Jesus is trying to open his eyes that he's not good. And so the way he does it is he shows him God's law, God's commandments, the things that God has said. And, and that ought to show us when I, when I measure myself against what God has told me to do, I ought to see, oh my, I, I need deliverance. But this man doesn't. He, he doesn't look at God's commands and see his own failure Actually, this young man, when he sees God's commands, he, he looks at it like a, a long checklist that he's already accomplished. Like, yeah, I, I've done all those things. Jesus says, keep the commands. And so the man's like, well, Jesus, the Old Testament has 613 commands. And so which, which ones? I mean, I'm, I'm keeping them as far as I know. Is there something like obscure that I'm missing? What is it specifically that I need to do to live forever? See, verse 17, Jesus says, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus picks a few, but Jesus doesn't pick some obscure ones. Like he's thinking, well, maybe there's just something I don't know. I'm missing one or something. 
But Jesus just quotes from the Ten Commandments that are from Exodus 20, the, the commands this man has memorized as a Jew. Look at what Jesus said, verse 18. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, all those commands except for that last one about loving your neighbor as yourself are, are part of the Ten Commandments. Jesus skips the first four commandments here when he's quoting them he, about how we should treat God, uh, how we should, a man should relate to God. And he, he goes straight to the, com the commandments about how we should relate to each other. And the ones that he lists are, it's, it's, he goes, commands number six, seven, eight, nine, and five. Don't murder, don't adult. Don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your parents. And then he quotes from Leviticus 19, 18, is in the Old Testament, but not one of the Ten Commandments. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's not one of the Ten Commandments, but Jesus will later use it as a summary of all the commands about how we should treat one another. If I love my neighbor as myself, then I'll keep the commandments. It's interesting, in Jesus' list of commandments here, there, there's only one of the, the second half of the Ten Commandments that he doesn't quote. He doesn't quote number 10. He doesn't say, thou shalt not covet. Why not? Why did he leave that one out? It, it kind of seems like Jesus is planning to get to that with this young man, but he's holding that for a bit later. Well, this young man has these commands memorized, and as Jesus is reciting them, he's just nodding his head. He's checking them off. As Jesus reads through them, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not a murderer. I haven't been unfaithful to my wife. I don't steal. I haven't borne false witness in court. I haven't shamed my parents. I care about other people. Boom, got it, right? Verse 20, the man says to him, all these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? So he's like, Jesus, I got it. I mean, that's basics. I do that stuff. In fact, in, in Mark, uh, that gives us a fuller quotation there, the young man says, from my youth up, I've done all these things. I, I've got these. Well, what else, Jesus? I, I feel like there's something missing. I'm, I'm getting the major stuff. Well, God's righteous commands should reveal to you how far you've fallen short of God's goodness, but it doesn't always work. Sinful people don't have the right reaction this young man, instead of seeing God's righteous commands and, and falling on his knees like, I am undone, woe is me, he sees his commands and he's like, yeah, that's me, I got it. And so many people that you talk to today are the same way. If you went to them and you said, hey, are you, do you think you'll go to heaven when you die? They'll say, yeah, I think so. And you say, well, why? Well, I keep, I've, I've always kept the Ten Commandments, they'll say. This is exactly the same thing that's, that's coming up here. This man says, I've kept them. But this young man <laughs> hasn't listened to the Sermon on the Mount. We were in Matthew chapter 5, right? And uh, Jesus was talking about what these commands really mean. Look here. When, when Jesus gave these, these commandments, as he's explaining what God meant when he gave the commandments, th we're not supposed to view these things as just external things things that I can accomplish. But each of these commandments, God means for us to take it into our heart and obey it from our heart. So for instance, the first command, uh, thou shalt not murder. Well, that doesn't just mean don't kill anybody. It means never be angry with or insult anyone. Because as Jesus explained, if I'm angry with my family, then it's the same heart of a murderer and God sees that evil heart and holds me accountable for that. If, if I say to you or to somebody, what an idiot. Jesus says I'm guilty of hell because that's the heart of a murderer. And so the command, you shall not murder, we shouldn't just check it off like, yep, never killed anybody, I'm good. We should be thinking, oh my, my heart's full of anger. I am a murderer. It, it, down through the commands, it goes like this. Don't commit adultery. Uh, the young man's thinking, yep, never slept with anybody else's spouse. Got that. But Jesus has explained in Matthew 5 already that what that means, don't commit adultery, it means never look at anyone but your spouse with lust in your heart. And, and if you do that, you've committed adultery. There's a passage of Scripture that says that many men and women, they live in perpetual adultery. It says they, they have eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin. I wonder what the percentage of people in the world today, God would look at their hearts and say, they have eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin. 
You shouldn't murder. You shouldn't commit adultery. Um, don't bear false witness is one of the Ten Commandments. The man's thinking, yeah, yeah, when it's been important, like when I've, taken, when I've been under oath, I've never, I've never under oath lied, anything like that. But that's, that's not what that's talking about. Jesus isn't just saying tell the truth when it matters, but always tell the truth like it matters. So if I tell a little lie to one of my kids to kind of get them to stop asking for something, I've just, I've just broken one of the Ten Commandments. I've not been truthful. And this is what Jesus is saying. These are what these commands are meant to do. It's to sh- it's to sh- we're, supposed to, we're supposed to obey these things from our hearts. Um, Jesus quoted there the love your neighbor as yourself. A lot of people read that and they're like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really good to the people around me. I take care of my family and I, the, my boss likes me and I'm, I'm, I love people around me. But Jesus isn't just saying take care of the people, people who take care of you, but love whoever God puts into your life. The good for you people and the bad for you people are all, we're supposed to be seeking their good at all times. And so, Really, we got to look at these commandments and be like, oh my, God, you see my heart and I, I've broken them all. But, but the young man isn't thinking of it that way. He's just got this, uh, okay, externally, yeah, check, 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 boom. What else? And, and Jesus needs him. If this man's going to be saved, he needs to get a different perspective. So Jesus continues to try to help him. Um, he, First, what are Jesus' words on how we obtain eternal life? First, you must confess that you're not a good person, but that you've completely failed to please God. Second thing Jesus says is this, to get to heaven, you must turn over everything in your life to Jesus. To get to heaven, you must turn over everything in your life to Jesus. Jesus realizes this man is blind to his own desperate need. But he cares for him. I love this passage here uh, from Mark. Mark gives us a, a little insight into what's happening that Matthew doesn't include in his story at this point. G- uh, he said to him, teacher, I've kept all these things from my youth up. And then Mark shows us Jesus' heart. Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. He doesn't want this man to perish. <laughs> he wants him to have eternal life. But the man's not seeing it. Verse 20, the young man said in Matthew here, the young man said to him, all these things I've kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. What's Jesus mean if you wish to be complete? Jesus is saying, it's the very thing we've been talking about. Do you, do you want to be good in God's eyes? Do you want to belong to me? Do you want to have eternal life? If you want those things, if you want to be saved, here's what you need to do. Jesus says, go sell your possessions and give them to the poor. And sometimes when I'm reading Jesus' words, I like want to raise my hand and object. Like Jesus, he's asking you how he can get to heaven and you tell him to go sell his possessions and give them to the poor. Like, is that what the Bible teaches anywhere else about how a person gets eternal life? N- no. I, this is, as far as I know, it's the only place where Jesus talks like this to an individual. Is that the way to be saved? Now, if it is, if that's the way to be saved, sell all your stuff and give it to the poor, then let's do it, right? Because eternal life, like, if that's what you got to do to get saved, then let's do it. Let's go, let's sell everything we have and let's give it away and hope that somebody else is doing the same thing and they give it back to us, you know, so we can eat, right? But I mean, if that's what you got to do, but listen, selling your possessions and giving them to the poor, that is not the way to be saved. You can do it. In fact, you can sell all your possessions and give them all away and still be on your way to hell. The Bible's very clear that there is no good deed that you can do that will make you right with God. Look here at Ephesians 2. The Bible says, God says, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, not as a result of giving all your stuff to somebody else so that no one may boast. Salvation comes by faith alone. Then if that's the case, if that's how you get saved, then why when this man says, Jesus, how do I get eternal life? Does he say, go sell all your stuff and give it to the poor? Well, salvation comes by faith alone, but what is saving faith? 
It's good for us to think through. Faith is no small statement to God, like, God, I believe you exist. Faith is a person saying to God, Lord, with all that I am, I embrace all that you are. Faith, faith is a person saying from their heart, I receive you. You're the Savior, you're my Savior. You are the Lord, you're my Lord. You are God Almighty and now you are my God and never again in my life will I put something above you. This man came to Jesus willing to do a little bit more in exchange for eternal life. He's willing to make sacrifices. He, he'll do whatever good thing Jesus sends him to do. But if you want to be saved, Jesus, what Jesus demands is that you give him all that you are. And right here with this man, he can see into his heart, right? And so he knows what it is that this man won't give. He can look into the, the heart of this rich man who's kneeling before him and saying, what do I do for eternal life? And see that the thing that's more important to God than him is his wealth. Luke talks about this rich man. He says that he was extremely rich. Jesus isn't giving this man a work to do for salvation, but he's giving him a test of where his heart is, and his heart isn't God's. And he wants the man to see it so that he can surrender. And so Jesus says to him with love in his heart, he says, listen, son, if you want to be whole, if you want to be complete, if you want to be forgiven, all that you are and all that you have has to be handed over to me. Well, will the man do it? <laughs> will the man do it? Yeah. Will he submit his life to Jesus, even if it means giving away all his possessions? Now, for you and me, it not, might not be the same as this man, right? But Jesus makes the same call to everyone who comes to him asking for eternal life. Just whatever you are and whatever you have, if you want eternal life, you have to say it's mine, right? Right? And so, if Jesus were to say this to you, if Jesus were to say, hey, if you want eternal life, I want you to say that, I want you to give me your family. Uh, if you want eternal life, I, I, want you to, I want you to give me your marriage. If you want eternal life, you have to hand over to me your possessions. What would you say to Jesus? Jesus is saying, if you want to have eternal life, you have to hand it all to me. Look at Matthew 19, verse 22. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. See, this young man came to Jesus thinking that he was good and that if he just did a few extra good things, he could punch his ticket to heaven. But he walked away from Jesus now knowing that he is not good. He walks away from Jesus sad now because he realizes he's choosing his possessions over God. And unless he comes back later to hand his life over to Jesus, he's never going to be forgiven. He's never going to have eternal life. Jesus asked him more than he was willing to give. Jesus wanted him to give him his all. And that's saving faith. In 1845, there was a group of English explorers that set out on an expedition to the North Pole. They had a couple of ships, and they were powering um, with steam engines, and so they needed to take along coal for their, for their ships. They're going to the North Pole. But this is called the Franklin Expedition. These explorers were careless in their ships. They thought they packed enough coal for the trip, and, and they had a lot of space left. And so they used that space for things that would be fun on the journey. They, they packed a large library, a barrel organ, china place settings, cut glass wine goblets, well, things didn't go as they planned. They ran out of coal up in, up in the north, you know? And when they did, their books and their teacups and their ornate musical instruments were not enough to warm their freezing bodies. And every last member of that expedition, all 128 men, died. People wanted to know what happened to them, and so years later, they were, they were sending out search party to try to find what was left of the ship and, and such. The search party found the remains of the men, of some men who had set off from the ship to walk for help. And the, in, amongst these men, they discovered one skeleton dressed in a fine blue cloth uniform edged with silk braid, sadly grasping in his hand a place setting of sterling silver flatware. And we say, how foolish. 
He's giving up what's essential for something that can't help him. But yet, today, millions of Americans are doing the same thing. They're clinging to their possessions over eternal life, clinging to their whatever it is. And instead of coming to Jesus and receiving from him a place in his eternal kingdom, but our sterling silver flatware will not bring us any comfort in the fires of hell. Listen to Jesus' words on how to obtain eternal life. So Jesus is talking to this man. He wants him to listen. And so he said two things. One, you must confess that you're not a good person, but that you have failed to please God. Listen. I know it's hard to say. It's hard to start thinking of myself as not good, right? I, I want to defend that somehow. I want to be, everybody know that I'm, I'm, I'm a good guy, but that's not what Jesus says is true. And, and there's, there's just no need to pretend as Christians, there's no need for me to pretend I'm great. I need to do the opposite and admit that I'm not. Look here, Isaiah 53, 6. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. This is the message of the gospel. I, I have failed. I've not lived up to God's goodness. But God sent his son to bear my full wrath, to bear your full wrath. And so we can come to God saying, God, I have failed and I've not been good, but he'll receive us because Jesus has paid the penalty, right? And then risen again. So to get to heaven, you have to confess you're not a good person. You've totally failed to please him. Secondly, to get to heaven, you have to turn everything in your life over to Jesus. It, it may be very well this morning, somebody listening online or somebody that's in the room has thought of themselves as a Christian because you do lots of good things and you try to obey the commands in the Bible. Well, we see that's not what being a Christian is, right? It's coming to Jesus and saying, I, I'm yours and I receive you. That's faith. Maybe you're at that place now and you just, you, maybe you're realizing, listen, I've, I've never given my all to Jesus. I've never handed everything over to him. Then, ah, uh, until this point, you're not saved, but Jesus offers it, right? He offers it if you'll trust in him. Okay, Jesus has got more to say here about how to obtain eternal life. The third thing he's gonna say in our passage today is that wealth makes it harder to get to heaven. Wealth makes it harder to get to heaven. Look at verse 23. So everyone's standing there with their mouths open. This man has just walked away, this rich young man. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen to what J.C. Ryle wrote about riches. He said this, riches which all desire to obtain, riches for which people labor and toil and become gray before their time, riches are the most perilous possession. They often inflict great injury on the soul. They lead people into many temptations. They engross people's thoughts and affections. They bind heavy burdens on the heart and they make the way to heaven even more difficult than it naturally is. And so he continues, let us pray daily for rich people's souls. They are not to be envied. They are deeply to be pitied because their prosperity in this world is often their destruction in the world to come. The litany of the church England, of England used to contain the words, in all time of our wealth, good Lord, deliver us. To get to heaven, you have to turn everything over to Jesus. It's just yours, Jesus. And the more earthly possessions you have, the harder it is to do that. And so Jesus says it's hard for a rich person to be saved. Look at verse 24. He continues on that theme. Jesus says, again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. What's Jesus saying? He's saying it's impossible. You can't fit a camel through a needle's eye. You can't do it. And rich people can't get saved. They're so tied to things of this earth and they won't give them over to Jesus. It's impossible, he says. Wealth makes it harder to get to heaven Fourthly, it's impossible for anyone to be saved, but God can do impossible things. It is. It's impossible for anybody get, to get saved, but God can do impossible things. Look at verse 24 again. Jesus says, and again, I say to you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? 
And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Do you know that no one gets saved unless there's a miracle of God in their lives? It is just so against our nature for us to come to God and say, God, I am a sinner. I am not good and I'm turning my life over to you. That's just, that doesn't come naturally. All of us want to object. We want to say, no, no, I, I've been working hard. I'm doing pretty good. I just need a little more help. We just, we object against it. And so what we need is for God to come to our stubborn hearts and help us to still agree. Yeah, God, I'm not good. You can see it in my life. I haven't lived up to it, but I'm giving it to you. That's a miracle of God, but he, he does it. He's done it for me and he's done it for so many of us. We should thank him for it. Jesus' words on how to obtain eternal life, it's impossible for anyone to be saved, but God can do impossible things. And one more thing, number five, to get to heaven, we must approach Jesus with the humble dependence of a small child. To get to heaven, you must approach Jesus with the humble dependence of a small child. Now, our story of the rich young ruler, it's included in Matthew and Mark and Luke, I think, because we need to hear this. And also, in Matthew and Mark and Luke, they all include, just before this story, another simple little story, and I think the accounts are meant to go together because there's a contrast that we're supposed to see. So turn back with me, uh, Matthew 19, verse 13. This rich man came to Jesus proud of his accomplishments, and because he wouldn't surrender, Jesus turned him away. That's the wrong approach to Jesus. The right approach to Jesus is in verse 13. Matthew 19, 13. Then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After laying his hands on them, he departed from there. Who's the kingdom of heaven belong to? The kingdom of heaven belongs to people who approach Jesus with the heart, with the attitude of a small child. People who come to Jesus just humbly, realizing I don't have anything to give you. People who would come to Jesus in faith and just trust him to do everything that needs to be done for them to be saved. Do you have eternal life this morning? If the answer is no, will you come to Jesus with the humble trust of a small child and just say, Jesus, I hold nothing back. I am yours. Save me. Even this morning while you listen in your living room, while you listen in this room, if you'll come to Jesus with that heart and just say, Jesus, I, I'm not holding anything back. I'm yours. Will you save me? And the moment you cry out to him, his answer will be yes. His answer will be this morning, the kingdom of heaven belongs to you. It's something he just gives to those who are humble. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you that You've made the way of eternal life clear to us. And it does. It goes against our, what we th think, how it should go. And God, and so we just, we, we pray. Lord, if there's somebody here that needs to let go of their own goodness and just humbly trust in you, hand their lives over to you, I pray that they might do that even this morning <laughs> and find your welcome and your love. You don't ever want anyone to walk away. You want them to come that you might heal them. Lord, Many of us, we think back to, the, to a time when we, uh, when we trusted in you and you made us new and you received us to yourself and we're just so thankful. That's not, it wasn't us. It wasn't because we were so perceptive that we picked up on that. You did a miracle in our hearts and you, you brought us to you and so we, we're thankful. You've just, you granted us this salvation. And so now we, we have eternal life and it's sure. We don't have to do anything. We didn't do anything to get there. You just gave it to us. We're so grateful. Lord, for us Christians, um, from the very beginning, when we came to you, we handed our everything over to you. What happens to us sometimes, Lord, is that uh, as we go along, there's things that come up, and maybe we start to put other things above you, whether it be wealth or stuff of this world or our sexual desires or what it, whatever it might be that we're putting above you, Lord, as, as Christians, that it can't be. And so even those of us who have trusted you before, Lord, will you search our hearts and if there's something that we're holding back, um, even this morning, Lord, we give that back to you. You're, you're our God. We love you. Um, we're yours.
Thank you so much for receiving us to yourself by your grace, by this great sacrifice that you made for us on the cross, and then your victory over death. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.